<laughs> Hi, everyone. Oh, that's a bit scary. Last minute hardware failure. I've swapped. Can you all hear me and see me? Yep. Yep. Um, I can see there's uh, 41 people. Tom, you're the main one for some reason. You're filling up my whole screen. Isn't that crazy? Hang on. I'll see if I can fix that. Oh, Joe, that looks nice. Where are you? You're on your veranda. Yeah, I'm uh, out the back on, on the eastern suburb. It's nice. Oh, very jealous. That's lovely. Um, I wish I could. Um, does everyone else have greenery? Does anyone see green? Like if it's not that quiet, then I probably no. <laughs> There's a nice greenery outside, but I'm stuck in my room. I can imagine it. Um, Hi, I can see everyone's going up. Thank heavens I'm not the last one to join. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to see you. Let me just adjust this camera. Remember that hopeless uh, um, uh, video uh, desktop camera I bought? I'm using its box as a stand, so it wasn't completely useless. How about that? <laughs> okay. Let's get the up, so they should be visible to you if you want to see them, but I'll collect them as well. Um, oh, there's a funny noise in the background. I wonder if that's from me. I'll turn me off. Oh, no, it's a weird sound. Oh, Lyria, hey, I can see you. Oh, Buffet, hi. A weird, almost feedbacky sound. But can other people hear it, or is it just me? I can hear it. I hear it. That's okay, weird. I hear it. Good people. I wish I had that with my children, or I guess probably you wish you had that with me. Um, okay, so let me just share the screen now. Here we are. So we missed Monday because we all had Easter. I hope you all had a fantastic Easter and um, did things that weren't necessarily work all the time. Uh, one thing I've noticed is the line between work and home has blurred so much that it's very hard to stop working at any given instant. Um, work just seems to always be on my mind. Uh, and that's a real issue. So, oh, Mark, I can see you've got greenery out your window. That's really nice. Hey, <laughs> lucky you. Uh, so I did try and speak, make some days on the weekend, just not work days. And it felt really weird. It's the first time I've ever done that. You probably couldn't do that because you're something awesome and things were all due in this week. But I hope you get to do that um, while we're off marking exams that you guys just relax and do some non-work. Um, okay, so today's a funny day because in theory, I was going to be overseas in America this week, um, going to a wonderful conference that I've wanted to go to now for about five years. And every year, for some reason, I can't go. And this year, finally, Lisa and I got our acts together. Well, Lisa got her act together because she's more organized than me. And we actually bought tickets and got registered. And I was like, now, of course, I can't go overseas. Um, so that's just showing me I'll never get to this conference. But um, I was going to be away. And today was just going to be a lecture uh, full of guest lecturers speaking. Um, but instead, all our wonderful extended lecturers, um, uh, the tutors largely, and a few outside people from Google uh, and, you know, former students have posted their lectures, uh, extended lectures as videos. So this week, we've got lots of watching you can do. Do catch up on the extended lectures that have been posted as videos. And I know lots of the speakers are offering uh, open chat sessions where you can log in and chat to them. I reckon make good use of that. Even if you're a normal um, course student, not in the extended stream, grab the chance because these are great people doing great, exciting things. Just pop along and have a look and ask some questions. Uh, it's this wonderful opportunity uh, to do that. So anyway, so we end up with this strange lecture, this right now, um, where there was nothing special planned, which is sort of good because I've missed bits and pieces as we've gone along the way through the course. Um, so we can catch up on all the missing bits and also we can just throw things open to you to have chats and we can talk about some interesting things that we, I thought we weren't going to have enough time to talk about. So I'm actually quite pleased. Um, so let me start. Unless anyone's got anything um, super pressing, my plan is that I'll just talk for a bit, racing through stuff, and then at the end we'll have a bit of a chat and we can talk about the exam, we can talk about something awesome, talk about anything you want to talk about and then we'll watch the movie. Um, so the first thing that I was going to do a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't do it that lecture, and then the next lecture we were, we were stuck at home, was remember I, I was going to show you focus, the focus problem, and I had a prop. Where did I put it? Oh, no, I just had it a second ago. But as I was swapping hardware, I bet I've knocked it on. Here. So I had this prop. Uh, let me just see. 
you can see, it's a torch. Oh, that's bright. Uh, and what I was going to do, I don't know if it's dark enough to do it now, was in the lecture theatre, I was going to shut all the things and make it completely dark and then put on this torch. And then I was going to go around the lecture theatre just pointing at it things. And you guys watching, you have to imagine this now because uh, even though we have a video connection, we don't have darkness. Um, but I want you to imagine what it would have been like. You're sitting at the back, it's a completely dark room, and you can see this little spot of light on things. And it would be on a student at one minute, and then we'd, we'd put it on a seat, and then I put it on part of the blackboard, and you'd see some words. And you'd go around with this torch, and like, oh, I like this, and I'd be just lighting things. You wouldn't see me, because I'd be in the dark. And what I was trying to um, demonstrate by doing that was this thing of focus. Humans, we're very good at focusing. So although you think you're seeing everything at the moment, actually your brain is really only focusing on, on, on one thing in the field of vision and everything else is sort of peripheral and it's filtering it out and, and sort of filling it in and tricking you into thinking you're seeing everything. But really your vision is quite focused uh, and some animals have it even more focused than ours. And our attention, I believe, that's a great metaphor for our attention. Our attention is always, or mine anyway, is focused. So we're very good at thinking of one thing we're not so good at thinking about two things and lots of things is really difficult. So how we tend to solve problems is we put all our focus onto one thing and that's great for solving that one thing. And if that's really the most important thing, that's a really appropriate and good strategy to have. But we do have to notice that we miss things that aren't in focus. So um, that we, I sort of wish I'd done that lecture because it's happening to us now live with the coronavirus. For a while, um, people like our Prime Minister were focused on other things like getting re-elected and going to the footy or looking after the economy or whatever is in their mind. Everyone's always focused on something. Like I told you that story about the Canadians in Halifax that were probably sitting at a cafe, um, maybe they were dating, maybe it was their first date they'd ever gone on together and they were nervous and they were talking, eating croissants and in the background some French guys run past shouting, look out, the, the ship, she explode or something in French and, and they're running past shouting this stuff and I bet those people would have said, oh, what was that? Or, oh, those French people are funny, aren't they? Or did, you, did he say something about explosion? Or they would have somehow, I don't think it would have changed anyone's behavior or attitude. It's very, you'd be an extraordinary person to suddenly be able to stand up in the middle of the date and, and grabbing the date with you, I hope, um, and run like crazy because someone suddenly said there's, uh, French guys have unexpectedly said there's an explosion. Maybe if you're in a theater and someone shouted fire, you'd be more primed because we've grown up with stories of theaters and fires and we're sort of a bit primed for that. But at a cafe, we're not primed to think that people will shout by shouting about, run by shouting about explosions and we should act. So I sort of think that's probably what happened with coronas at the time, the coronavirus at the time we should have all been looking at it and thinking about it, our focus was somewhere else. And so there were delays. And in some countries, the delays were much longer than others. And in, in some countries, leaders or people or the experts advising the people were remarkably efficient or lucky or insightful and managed to switch focus really quickly. It is quite difficult to do. And those countries got very, countries got very prepared. And now we've all switched focus. And I've noticed that people, when I had switched focus, that were still thinking it was silly, um, uh, subsequently have, I mean, there were people who did it before me, of course, I'm not saying I was exceptionally normal, uh, abnormal, but I noticed the people that switched after me somehow often seem to switch even more passionately than me. So they, they, they took their focus from whatever they think, like the prime minister took their focus from this thing they were thinking about. And now they're thinking about Corona and their focus is entirely on Corona. So it's like the torch is now on Corona. Um, and so that's great for solving Corona. But don't forget there's this whole lecture theater that we're not looking at while we're looking. So our whole life and mankind, and humanity and everything and civilization has to keep going. It's not just all about Corona. So the danger with Corona is a classic security danger that either we ignore a problem entirely, we don't even see it's there, or if we focus on the problem, we focus on it to the exclusion of everything else. And we saw that with the 9-11 terror attacks. Um, when they happened, people flipped from not thinking about terror attacks to thinking about it completely and obsessively. And in America and in Australia, actually, a whole heap of laws were suddenly passed um, to try and control terrorism and to give the p police and the courts and the, and the government and the military and the spy agencies and so on, all these extra powers to control terrorism. And everyone was focusing on terrorism for quite a while. And, and in fact, one our um, dean of law, an amazing man, George Williams, you should Google him and look up some of his writings. He's written a lot about this. And I think one of the things he said, gee, I wish I could remember the exact number, but it was something like Australia has passed, oh, I can't remember the number of bits of legislation to do with terror, but it's a really not large number. And I think over the 20 years, it averages something like one every seven weeks. I think we've passed more legislation to control terror 
than any, I think pretty much than any country in the world. I think even more than America. We're just so obsessed about it. So of course the danger now with Corona is that we're all focusing on Corona and we might act that same thing again. And we're starting to see it with legislation being passed. Suddenly, oh, it's terrible. You infect someone with coronavirus, I hear now you get life imprisonment for that. I don't know if that thought bubble will turn into legislation. And, and people are being arrested and thrown in jail and all helicopters are being used. It's suddenly, whoa, the whole mechanisms of the state is on this thing. And that's good to solve corona, but we can't forget that there are other problems as well. And it's possible by focusing on one thing, we'll miss on other things. Okay. And this is all a long introduction to, to this week's case study, which is the government contract contact tracing app. So has anyone here wave at me? Have you already done the case study from today? Does anyone have a tutorial today? Oh yeah, someone did. Who's that? Lachlan? Yeah. How did it go, Lachlan? You can just push down the space bar to talk, I believe. Yeah, really good. Um, really good opinions from the whole class, actually. It was really good. I guess everyone knows the, knows the scenario really well. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I'm so pleased to hear that. So, um, so those of you who haven't got had the case study yet, you're really lucky you've got it coming up. Do read up about it in advance. Read up about the contact, contact tracing apps. It's a brilliant um, idea that seems to have appeared simultaneously around the world. And lots of people have had it. Um, the idea is, let's, it's this thing we always say about a, to a man with a hammer, to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I guess if you're a tech person, you instantly think coronavirus, let's come up with an app that can solve that. And probably if you're a carpenter, you'd think coronavirus, I wonder if there's a piece of furniture that could solve that. So suddenly a lot of people are coming up with apps uh, and I've listed some in the readings, um, but there's many more. Every time I go online now, I read about more people coming up with their really brilliant app for solving the whole coronavirus problem. Uh, and uh, the torch thing, absolutely, these apps don't have zero value. They have some value. But um, if we widen the torch out and actually just turn on the room lights, we'll see actually these apps also have the potential to cause a lot of damage as well. So we now have to be quite careful to work out whether we're going to use the apps or not. So there's a, the government's proposing an app, uh, Google and Apple uh, putting together, and what did we call them? Uh, Google. <laughs> uh, uh, are merging together in a historic first to put together some functionality in their uh, mobile phone operating systems uh, to allow contract tracing to happen. Um, and uh, the British government's announced they're going to have an app, um, uh, which is probably why we're going to have one in Australia. And Singapore's got one and lots of other countries are coming up with apps. So the idea of let's have an app to trace people and spot contract tracing. So please everyone do read about that and think about it before the case study, because in the case study, you're just going to debate and discuss all the whole room full of light. Hopefully we'll turn off the torch and turn on the whole room and we'll look at everything, all the benefits and all the costs and all the risks and all the advantages. And we'll just try and weigh the whole thing up to get a, a sense of what the actual real landscape is. here. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's ideas and all the thoughts you have, because this is new territory. This is sort of quite exciting. We're, we're doing things now that are new, that have not ever been done before. So there's no right or wrong. Who knows what's right or wrong? History will tell us in five years, I guess in retrospect, it'll be obvious. But right now we're in the middle of it. I remember after 9-11, lots of people saying different things. It was hard to know who was right or wrong then. It's hard to know. The civil libertarians were grumbling about the Patriot Act. Um, the, you know, the other people were grumbling that it wasn't strong enough. The intelligence agencies were saying they needed still more power. Who was right? It was very hard to tell. Um, and it's becoming clear, I guess, as time goes by, some of the consequences of the decisions we've made. But of course, we can never go to that alternative universe where we made other decisions. So it's very hard. So you're in the middle of such a time now. So this is our most relevant, in the sense it's the most current uh, case study. So put lots of thought into it. Uh, and I hope this is now priming you to go forward after this course and constantly think about the news as it happens and think about, um, uh, you know, analyzing situations as they arise. Um, so catch up week. In this week, as we're doing all our catch-ups, you're going to get to have a lot of fun, though I guess you've also got lots of work at the same time, because there's lots of fun things to watch. First of all, there's the film The China Syndrome that we'll be watching after the lecture tonight. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen it before. It is a beautiful film. I do quite like that film. Very idealistic and, you know, 1970s, rah, 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 Jane Fonda. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Michael Douglas it is just quite amazing. Um, now that film will be in the exam. The exam question won't, oh gee, everyone sat up all of a sudden. That, that I'm gonna say that more often. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm, my family and I are getting a new dog and that's gonna be in the exam. Oh, look, everyone's looking happy. Oh, this is fantastic. I'm gonna try this with my children at home. Hey guys, guys, can someone help me with the washing up? No, I'm, I'm being silly, okay. Um, 
so yeah, we are getting a new job dog though. It's really good. I don't know what the current dog's going to think about it, but we're we're all just so incredibly excited by it. Uh, so uh, the China syndrome. It's going to be in the exam in the following sense. Uh, I like you guys doing analysis. As you know, this course is often about analysis. So we give you a situation and then you just have to spot what's interesting about it. And sometimes you'll see things that I haven't spotted. And sometimes, um, you know, you'll each see things that each other haven't spotted. There's no, in, in the same sense here, there's no right or wrong answer. We just want to see you go through the process of analysis and come up with sensible things and not miss obvious things. Um, now, for the case studies that you do each week, we give you background reading to do and prep. We don't want to give you background reading and prep or much in the exam because that just wastes your exam time. So we're going to give you, as we do every year, one film to watch. You watch that film anytime you want. You don't have to watch it tonight. And then that gives you the context for the question. So when we give you the question, um, all the background readings essentially have been done. So we could say something like, um, you know, in the scene where, um, uh, 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 in Die Hard, in the scene where the uh, plane's coming in to land, what are the things that the flight tower could have done or, um, or what legislation could have been passed to prevent the sort of issue that happened um, uh, uh, when Macaulay Calcum was, was at home and the burglars came. Also, you know, we can just ask questions like that. And basically, you know, the, the context. So the question this year is based on the China syndrome. And that's a film we're watching this week. If you don't watch it this week, that's fine. Just rent it. Um, I haven't found a free place for it yet. There could well be a free place for it somewhere um, because we have lots of subscriptions to different uh, film libraries. Um, but you can watch it on YouTube for a couple of bucks or you can buy it for a couple of bucks more. And if anyone has a problem and can't afford to buy it or watch it, let me know and I'll write you a different question. And I'm, I'm thinking also the exam, the way I'm writing at the moment, I think I'm going to have more questions than I need. There'll probably be one option. So you probably get to choose. So if you haven't watched it, it's not the end of the world. You can pick another question instead. But if you watch it, of course, you get more options. So do watch the China syndrome. If you can stay back and watch it with us tonight, it'll be fun because we talk a little bit at the end of the film and chat about what it was like and our ideas. Um, the, Next week, your case study is on Apollo 13, which is, again, another famous story. And there is a movie about that. I reckon you should watch the movie. That would be the best, uh, very good prep you could do for the case study. So um, I strongly suggest people try and watch the Apollo 13 movie. I haven't hunted around looking for links for that yet. I have a vague feeling it might be free on that library site that we found before. But anyway, do try and watch that movie if you can. Or just read about it. You don't actually have to watch the movie. Um, but just know enough about it to do the case study next week. Um, and then the last thing is all these presentations we're doing at the moment that the tutors are doing and some students are doing wonderful ones. Um, uh, Lana did one last ma yesterday. I missed it. Um, and I'm joking. Sorry. Uh, um, oh, you're laughing. Uh, and so uh, there's a couple of others that are just popping up. So everyone just look around and watch as many of these things as you can, because they are quite wonderful. The tutors are recording the something awesomes and the presentations. Uh, and as they come up, I'll make them available too. So you can watch them. So you can see other people's something's awesomes. Um, what I've heard today from the ones that have happened today is they've been incredible. It's been a wonderful experience. So I, I can't wait to see it. Well done to everyone with that. Um, so lots of watching. Do make sure you do lots of watching if you can uh, uh, over this week. Uh, is awed. Now that's something I've never talked about and it was in the notes. I don't think I ever mentioned it. It's a thing. Oh, gee, here's, uh, I'm, I'm going to say it's David Hume, but I've just realized that's just me thinking that and my brain is funny, but it's, I believe it's David Hume, the philosopher was obsessed with this difference between the is and ought. So what something is, what it's actually like and what it should be like. And they're very different things. So what something is like is something that science can answer or measurement can answer or observation can answer. And that's a clear answer. And usually that's true, false, though perhaps it's a little hard to work it out, but let's just say that's true, false. What something ought to be, well, that's much trickier. Who knows what something should be like or should happen? That's a much more difficult thing. And what Hume was interested in is we tend to mix those things up. And we tend to think that the way something is is the way it ought to be. And often in arguments justifying why you should do something, people will made a, make a pleading to what has happened in the past or, 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 or what is, you know, should you do this or not? Someone will say, well, we never do that. But of course, that's a description of what is not, is what ought. And the reason, and I think the is ought thing, once you start noticing it and looking for it, you see it everywhere. It's very easy to make that mistake. I guess that's um, sort of uh, the philosophy of, conservatism maybe in some way is saying what is is very similar to what ought um uh, and um 
and in, in many ways that makes sense because what is stop the world isn't exploding with all the what is's so if we keep doing the what is the way they have maybe it'll continue to not explode i mean there's a certain safety in keeping as many things as similar as possible but still it, you should be aware when you're doing it so it's very interesting to think about when you've got an is and an ought problem why am i talking about it because it seems to me that this is a fundamental concept that we keep bumping into in this course one is we see it with type one type two errors so type one type two errors tend to be looking at when what is and what ought misalign. So uh, it's great if something isn't the case and it shouldn't be the case. And it's great if something is the case and it should be the case, but we've got a type one error if, oh no, I can never remember which is which. We've got one of those sorts of errors if it is the case, but it shouldn't be. And the other sort of the errors is uh, if, if it isn't the case and it shouldn't be. So uh, the example I guess we used before was um, someone is uh, locked up in jail for murder. Now, they either are or aren't locked up, they either are or aren't found guilty, and they either did or did not commit the crime, I guess, so they ought or ought not to be in jail. Perhaps that's slightly more problematic because there might be philosophical and values there. And, but a type one, error, one of the errors anyway happens when you've locked someone up <laughs> who shouldn't be locked up, and the other sort of error happens when you fail to lock someone up that should be locked up. And as we've talked over and over again in the course, this misalignment between the two seems baked into the universe and increasing one, decrease, uh, decreasing one increases the other, unless you spend lots of money and make lots more effort. So there tends to be this sort of trade-off. Um, but is this sort of difference between what is and what ought is I think a wider philosophical thing that we also bump into in this course in lots of other ways too. Like for example, with the problem of authentication. It, it seems to me that what is is one world and what ought is this abstract world of, of, you know, in our mind? Um, and with authentication, we've got these, this same challenge of two worlds. We've got what the computer thinks and sees. It sees all these ones and zeros at the end of the day. And then by executing an algorithm, it makes a decision. And then, and then we've got real identities, real humans in the real world that the computer can never see. It's not like Tron. The computer's not in the real world. So when the computer says, uh, let this person into the room because they are Sarah Jane Smith. Um, maybe it's right or maybe it's wrong because it's having to breach those two worlds. And whenever we breach those two worlds, there's this chance of error because the two worlds never exactly line up. And we'll see that again today with PKI when we look at that, the problems of um, public key uh, infrastructure. And it happens all the time in this course. Basically, whenever you've got something happening in the computer world, but we want to lift that to having an effect in the real world, which is more or less the definition of computer security, isn't it? There's a problem that the real world is different to the computer world and the computer can't really ever know about the real world. And the real, yeah, okay. So there is this really interesting challenge. Whew. So I'm glad we finally got to talk about is or and I got to tell you about David Hume, a Scottish philosopher who I really, really love. Um, okay, so Mitnick's attack. This is a famous attack that I've talked about so many weeks. I think I even mentioned it in week one and we always run out of time and I never get to talk about it. So with your indulgence, I'd like to talk about it now if you're interested in knowing about it. Kevin Mitnick, we've talked about lots of times. He's on the speaker circuit now, he makes lots of money. He's written a whole lot of books beginning with The Art Of. So he wrote um, the, the Art of Deception was his famous first book about social engineering and the first book of his I read and actually the first book on social engineering I read and I still think it's one of the best. Um, but he's also written The Art of Invisibility which someone recommended to me and I it's just arrived for me from Amazon, so thank you very much. Um, and he's written lots of other arts of, uh, um, except not, of course, the art of war. Uh, and so he's uh, he was sent to jail for committing various crimes, uh, or who sent to jail for various reasons. Uh, and then he got out of jail, and now he's out in the world. Uh, he wasn't ever charged with everything, so I guess there's something hanging over his head. He could be charged with other things. So he's always very careful what he says or admits to in public. But um, he's now a consultant making lots of money and advising people and speaking at conferences. Uh, I haven't seen him do an actual attack for a long time, though he always demonstrates interesting ones at conferences, but nothing um, that's uh, unheard of, but certainly very good chairmanship and very impressive, his attacks. So he's always fun to watch at a conference. Um, but we have great respect for him because of what he did in the old days. And this attack, is one of the first attacks that made me go, oh, computer security is interesting, isn't it? Oh, this isn't just trivial. There is beauty and creativity in this field. So let me tell you about his attack. Uh, and even though the attack is now out of date, the ideas behind the attack still happen all the time and his approach to the attack is still quite beautiful. So here's how it goes. I need to tell you, first of all, how TCP IP works. Just a little bit about how it works. I know most people already know it. Oh. Kristen, you've got trees in your backyard too. How come? You're just somewhere beautiful. I'm so impressed. 
damn, I'm getting a pot plant in here. So here we go. Let's have a look on uh, this screen here. I'm just going to make it go full size. How do I do that? Stop sharing. Sounds like an instruction from Donald Trump, doesn't it? Here we go. Um, this is our blackboard. And you can see I've got the British Navy down here. Oh, how am I going to do it so you can hear me? I'll stand right next to the mic. Oh, yeah, you can see I've got my Putin T-shirt on. Yeah, Putin in, in uh, gear riding a bear. This is what he does all the time. He is awesome. I love Putin. So um, the British Navy is our um, is going to be uh, Shimamura Mura. I never had a, know how to say his name. You'd think after 20 years I'd get it right. Um, he's the target of this attack. Um, and Mitnick is going to be that untrustworthy company, country, that sneaky, dastardly place, Canada. There's Mitnick. And I, I sticky taped a dinner plate behind here, like a baking tray behind here, so it's magnetic. So, it's not. so now, Mitnick, victim, Shimamura, Shimamura. Now, I want to just tell you how a TCP IP handshake, a TCP handshake works, first of all, for those of you that don't know the three-way handshake, just so you can understand the beauty of this attack. How it works is if I want to establish a connection with you, um, I engage in a handshake, first of all, that says, I want to have a connection and we're going to treat it like a phone line. So instead of treating it like a whole series of letters or postcards we send each other, which we could send in one order and could arrive in a different order and we'd have to reassemble them, which is UDP, for example, that's a, a protocol that doesn't require the packets to um, arrive in the same order they were sent. TCP is a protocol that sends, takes a stream of things in sequence, breaks them into chunks, sends them across the internet willy nilly so they could arrive in who knows what order, but at the other end they're reassembled back into the right order and the stream is rebuilt at your end. So the challenge of, one of the challenges of TCP is it has to take packets, chunks that are sent across the internet and reassemble them somehow into streams. So it needs to reorder them together and if one of them doesn't turn up, it needs to request for it to be resent so you don't have gaps in the stream and so on and so on. All right, so before we start a TCP connection, because unfortunately the, the way um, the computers do networking is they do it through things called ports. So the, the messages go out through something called a port on your computer, which is a logical idea. Your computer actually only has one input and output probably, it just has one network cable, but inside it's, they mentally imagine it's 20 or a thousand or some number of different ports. Uh, and we imagine there's different wires coming over the ports and all the ports have different numbers. So um, for example, in the old days, different protocols use different ports. So using mail uses, I can't remember, gee, it's embarrassing, 23, 25 or something. Um, you use um, uh, HTTP, it uses port 80 um, if you're a server. Um, so as long as the number of protocols we could use was different to the number of ports, uh, and as, as long as only one person could connect to you at any one time for any one protocol, I guess you haven't really got a problem here. You just say, oh, this wire I'm always using for Kermit and this wire I'm always using for, um, you know, some uh, X server or something. This, you know, this I'm always using for HTTP. But then as more and more pro protocols were developed, we started to have more protocols and we had port numbers. And also some protocols let you talk to many people simultaneously, like you might be having lots of web tabs open at the same time. Um, so now you've got all these uh, streams you want to have, but they're now sort of multiplexed. You know, you've got all the streams going out as packets and then at the other end, they've got to be reassembled and broken into the different streams. Now this was packet seven for that web page, and this was packet 15 for that web page. So how they do that is um, they make a logical thing called a, a connection or a, a socket. So uh, a TCP connection works by me saying, or one person saying, so for example, Canada, in this case, we let's not have moral values. This is just a random connection. It doesn't have to be Mitnick at the moment. Suppose Canada wants to set up a connection to the British Navy. Oh no, let's say Australia wants to set up a connection to the British Navy. That's better. So Australia, uh, uh, so the, the, uh, suppose the British Navy want to initiate it. So they send a packet to Australia saying, and that's called a SYN packet, S-Y-N, to synchronize. And it, they're saying, I want to set up a connection and we're going to make a, uh, send a whole lot of packets and reassemble them into a stream. Do you want to do this with me? Let's make a connection. Okay, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And 
and Australia sends a packet back, which is called the SYNAC packet. So acknowledging the first SYN packet and sending a SYN of their own, a synchronizer of their own, saying, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And he's had to talk to me. And then the British Navy sends an ACK back saying, yeah, I got your packet. And now we're all set up. We can talk to each other. Now, what's, what's inside the SYN packet that lets them do this? It's very simple. It's just a single number called a sequence number. And then every packet that's sent from then on, the sequence in that conversation, the sequence number increases by one. So if I get a, if we say, I'm going to start my sequence number here at 1000. So my ACT packet to the British Navy's ACT packet would say um, to the Australian, would send to Australia, um, SIN starting with sequence 1000. And Australia thinks, okay, whenever I talk to um, Britain now, I have to use the, he's expecting a sequence starting at 1000. And I'll reply saying, acknowledge, and also my sin is 9,000 because maybe I'm using for some, uh, something else. And when I send that back, I send the sequence number so it knows how to reassemble the packets. And the sequence number I use when I send it back is 1,001 because it's the second packet on this conversation with him. So I say, uh, packet, uh, the sequence number 1,001, I acknowledge your connection and my number is going to be 9,000. And then um, the British Navy responds to me uh, to Australia saying, uh, acknowledge I got your sin. So that's the third leg here. And it calls its packet 9001, if that makes sense, because it's now uh, sent talking to me and I'm expecting packets around starting around 9000 and the British Navy is expecting packets starting around 1000. Um, and then so Australia can be getting millions of packets coming in all the time. It might get in packet 1 million, but it knows there's nothing to do with the conversation from Britain because the next packet it's expecting from Britain is going to be. Um, uh, 9,002 is the next one it's looking for. So it ignores all packets that aren't 9,002 as far as this conversation is concerned. So that's how it multiplexes. So you could have nine or 10 conversations going on at once because the, the numbers can be quite large. Uh, and uh, as long as the numbers are far away from each other, the conversations don't get jumbled. Whew, that was a very long, oh, Rowan, that's beautiful. That's not your real background, is it? I can't quite see what it is. No, this is just a background. Oh, I see there. Oh, that's an awesome background. Well done. Okay. Um, so does everyone make sense? Just thumb, thumbs up if, if that makes sense. It was a very long explanation of a TCP three-way handshake, but now you know about it. Because Mitnick exploited it. It sort of always made sense. Notice it's just a protocol for doing something. It's not a security protocol. But in the early days of computing, <laughs> and now, people made a mistake in thinking something that's a bit complicated, that I can't imagine how anyone could fake it, that's giving me a bit of security. The only thing that gives you security, of course, is a security protocol that you've verified and tested and logicians have looked at and security people have looked at and cryptographers have looked at. Just a random thing you're doing that looks a bit complex that you think must be giving you something, no, that's worth nothing. So people used to think that that was quite secure and your conversations couldn't get muddled and no one could pretend to be part of someone else's conversation because the sequence number when you start a conversation uh, is randomly generated. So no one from outside could know what your conversation was and you only send it to the person you're talking to so no one can observe it. So it all looked pretty safe. But what Mitnick showed was that was just wishful thinking. So let's look at his attack. Let's have Mitnick here. Um, he's Canada. What he wants to do is attack the British Navy. He discovered that the British Navy, he did some recon first of all, used the R suite of programs, R, uh, as in um, R host, and uh, I can't even remember, all the ones starting with R. Uh, there's a whole lot of normal commands that begin with R and you can do them remotely. Um, so they let you do things you could normally do in your terminal, but you can send an R command and to do it. So I don't know if there was such a thing as R cat, um, yucky. Rsync. Yeah, yeah, Rsync, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's when, that's actually what I have that all the time. It's when you leave the biro in your pocket uh, without the lid on. And you, at the end, you have to throw away your pants. So um, the, uh, what happens is in the R suite of programs, if you're a bit lazy, you could set up a file where you listed all the computers you trusted. And you'd list their IP address. 
only works for computers that have a static known IP address. And then if a command came in from one of those computers you trusted, it would get executed as though you were doing it. And that was really convenient. I used to use it in the old days too. If you had a little, in the lab, a couple of computers all set up, you could sit in on any one of them and then run a command on any other one of them and you wouldn't have to walk around to the other ones to run the command. Very, very convenient. And the security seemed good because you couldn't fake the um, IP address, I, th I thought, because the packets coming in have the IP address of the conversation. It's on, it's on the packet. And to fake that would mean the conversation would go somewhere else. So it wouldn't do an attacker any good to fake the IP address because then they wouldn't get the conversation to be able to do anything. So anyway, he discovered Mitnick was using the R suite of programs and had a file set up, an R host file set up, which said all the hosts that it trusted, all the hosts that he would trust to run as himself. So if a command came from any of them, it was him. So what Mitnick decided was, I'm going to send commands as though they're coming from Shimomura. I'm gonna send some R commands and I'm gonna make Shimomura's computer think that it's coming from one of his trusted computers. So I could, he could send whatever command he wanted. And actually the command he sent was simply, he adjusted the host file to include some uh, symbols that meant anyone could log in at any time <laughs> without a password. Um, the sort of thing that it's hard for um, uh, Sherman Murray to detect because it didn't stop him logging in because it's hard to tell that other people have powers. You can normally just tell when your own powers are diminished. You can't tell when extra powers are given to someone else. So he decides he's going to send this, uh, this command in uh, to echo the uh, plus symbols into the R host file so anyone can do it. But it's only going to work if this command comes from one of the trusted computers that the British Navy trusts. Now, who does the British Navy trust? Well, we all know there's only one place they trust other than themselves and the Queen, and that's Australia. Any command coming from Australia is always obeyed by the British Navy as though it was issued by the British Navy itself. Uh, with the exception of when they stole our warships in World War II, full of our own troops and were directing them around. And our prime minister asked them to send it back when the Japanese were coming close to invading Australia and said, please send our warships and our troops home. We need them in Australia. And the British prime minister at the time, Churchill said, no, you can't have them. And the prime minister said, yes, we can. And he rang up and told his own captain, please bring our troops home. And then he went to bed and Churchill rang up the ship and said, no, send them off somewhere else because I want them. And the captain turned around and said, well, somewhere else. Gee, our prime minister was really annoyed. But let's go back to this story here. The British Navy, how are we going to trick them? So here's how he did it. He, by doing some probes and trying to connect to the British Navy, he discovered that there was a pattern in how the sequence numbers were handed out. They weren't handed out randomly after all. Every new conversation started 128,000 higher than the last conversation. So if the last conversation had started at 1,000, the next conversation initiated would start at 1,029, uh, 129,000. So if you knew the sequence number of the last conversation, you knew the sequence number of the next conversation that it would initiate. So we waited till New, um, Christmas Eve, I think it was, late at night, when no one would be connecting into Sumimura's machine. And he sent one packet down there and he got a reply and that told him the current sequence number because it was proposing, oh, well, let's say it's a thousand. It was proposing, sure, I'll have a conversation with you. Let's start with a thousand. And he knew, okay, the next time anyone starts to connect to this guy, the, the British Navy is going to suggest, let's start the conversation at 129,000. Then he sent a packet to the British Navy but on the packet, you have to say who's sending the packet, what your IP address is. Now, they'll reply to that address. So you'd think you have to tell the truth because if you tell the wrong one, they'll just reply to the wrong one and you won't see the reply. But he thought, I don't care if I see the reply or not. So he sent a reply. He sent a message to the British Navy saying an ACK packet. I'd like to open up a connection. And he gave Australia's IP address, which, as you remember, is trusted by the British Navy. I'm coming from Australia. This is Australia calling. I'd like to start a conversation. Now, of course, the British Navy replied to Australia, thinking it was coming from Australia, saying, sure, we can do a conversation. I'd like my part of the conversation to start with uh, the number 129,000. Shimomura knew, realized he didn't need to see the whole conversation. If he knew what was going on, he could just do his part of the conversation and ignore all the replies. So the only danger he faced was that 
when the British Navy sent their reply to the fake packet, they would send it to Australia and Australia would say, what the heck are you talking about sending me this packet? I didn't try and initiate a connection. Reset the connection. That's not right. Something's gone mental. So what he did was he denial of service to Australia. Mitnick just bombarded the Australian server with a whole lot of harp open connections. It said, I'd like to have a connection, please, initiating the three-way handshake. And Australia would reply saying, sure, let's have it. And then he'd send another one saying, I'd like to have a connection, please. And they go, sure, let's do it. Another one, I'd like to, and he just bombarded it with all these requests, but he never replied to any of them. In fact, he actually spoofed where it was coming from. So Australia was saying sure to all over the place, not back to him. But what it does is it then waits there and keeps the connection open and waits for quite a good time in case you're taking a long time to reply. It's very compassionate. So it takes quite a lot of work and consumes resources just sitting there waiting. And Mitnick sent so many of these half open requests that it overloaded the server and the server used up all its slots. So the server is just flat out now meant just can't do anything. Just dealing with this ridiculous flood of people wanting to talk to it, saying they want to talk, but not doing anything. So, when Mitnick then sent the message to here saying, let's have a conversation. And by the way, I'm Australia. And when the British Navy replied to Australia saying, sure, let's start the conversation at 129,000, the packet up here might as well have just been thrown away. Australia was too busy to look at it. So it just got lost. So absolute silence, except Mitnick replies saying, cool, thanks for accepting my friend request to start this conversation. And he sends it back with sequence number 129,001. So to the British Navy, it looks like it's just completed a three-way handshake with Australia. And it, then it sends its first packet. And it, its first packet is, I'd like to echo this command, <laughs> uh, to double plus into uh, your Aarhus file. And British Navy, so, and he says, again, this is coming from Australia and uses sequence number 129,001. And British Navy goes, sure, back to Australia. I've done that. I've modified the Aarhus files, as you've suggested. Again, Australia doesn't reply because Australia's too busy. And now he's done it. He can do nothing else. He can stop attacking Australia. Australia goes back to normal. This guy goes back to normal. All the connections time out, but now he's modified the Aarhus file. Does everyone, what do you think? That's a pretty clever attack. Does anyone want to say anything about that? I'd like to know, did he come up with all those different premises himself or was that denial of service something that was actively in use at that particular point in time and he came up with the, the, uh, the sequences of the packets? Yeah, that is a really good question. So I believe, and again, we're relying on a memory here that's more than a decade old. I believe that was certainly the first time I'd seen the, um, the spoofing of that the handshake. So I believe he came up with that himself. I'm glad to be corrected, but I actually think, and that's sort of why he blows my socks off. Um, but did he come up with the idea of denial of service? I don't know. It would seem extraordinary if he had, because it is such a simple idea. But I do have a vague recollection that the idea of bombarding someone with half open handshakes that was the first time I'd heard about it when I was reading about his attack. So I don't know, maybe that's homework for us, me and you. Did he, did he come up with that particular way of doing a DOS attack? Um, does, oh, thank you, yes, thank you, Rachel. Um, so I'm not sure, and that was a great question, thank you, because it'd be doubly impressive if he came up with that as well. And that reminds me, it's something I keep meaning to tell everyone, you should look up about how DOS attacks work, denial of service attacks work. Just see some examples of them. There's some, I mean, they've been around for so long, but just get a sense for them. The idea is you want this work factor to be high. The amount of work the attacker does has to be much less than the work, amount of work the defender has to do. That's what lets you scale them up. Um, otherwise you need a ridiculous number of machines, which is actually possible now too, if you've taken over lots of machines. But could everyone just look up denial of service distributed denial of service and a reflected distributive denial of service, because I just see them all use, I mean, they're just three of the very early types of denial of service attacks uh, using TCP or, or using IP. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, I think you should know about at least those three things. It's an idea of how to do the attack, how to amplify the attack and another way of an even cleverer way of how to amplify the attack. So it's, it's worth learning all those three. So DOS, DDoS and reflected DDoS. Um, and of course, there's many other types of denial of service attack as well, but you should know about those. Um, that was good. Good question. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Crickets. <laughs>
Uh, okay, all right. Well, let's let's go back to the um, let you know. So I've finally got Mitnick's attack out of the way. I'm so pleased to do that. Um, so uh, a talk tower. I never know how to pronounce it. That's um, time of check, time of use. I don't believe I've told you about that, but that's uh, attacks that it's just a sort of attack that exploits a difference. If at the time you check something, it's different to the time you use something. So classic examples are, um, did I tell you about the McDonald's attack already? I might've mentioned it. I can't remember. Uh, I saw some Dutch or German guy do it once. It did blow me away because it was so simple. I'm sure the video of it's still available on YouTube. I liked it so much. I possibly have talked about it every lecture and I'm now completely boring you. But um, the idea was someone went to a McDonald's drive through and they went up to the place where you pay and they said something like, um, oh, sorry, I got in this queue by, I think when they went to the ordering place, the ordering thing, they said, oh, I'm sorry, I got here by mistake. I was trying to park. I just got stuck in this queue. And then the ordering person said, don't worry, that's fine. Then they drove on to the place where you have to pay. And they said, oh, hi, I was just speaking to you a second ago um, because the person that you pay, at least in this shop, was the person that did the ordering. That was me. Um, sorry, I just got stuck in here. I actually was just looking for a park and the person laughed and said, don't worry, just keep going through. And then they drove up to the next window, which was the collection window, and they said, thank you. And they just reached out and took the meal, which had been ordered and <laughs> paid for by the person behind them in the queue, if that made sense. So at the point where you authenticate, make the order, and when you pay for the order, and then when you collect the order, they're all different points in time. So if you can leverage that, that's a top tower attack. Um, uh, timing attacks like that are quite famous and interesting when they can happen and they can be hard to pull off, but when they, you can pull them off, they're quite amazing. We, last year we were talking about it and we realized, I think I'd just gone taken a, an interstate flight and I realized there was another Toktow sort of vulnerability thing there that they were authenticating me when I was checking in on the domestic flight. So they I think I might've even had to show them photo ID and all sorts of various things. And then they gave me a, a boarding pass but I didn't use that till 20 minutes later out of line of sight of the person that had given me the boarding pass. I could have easily handed that boarding pass to someone else and they could have used it. Um, and I know some countries do check people as they board against ID and things like Singapore's quite good at doing that. But it seemed to me that this was a top tower attack in Australia anyway, that uh, the time of checking the uh, credential is different to the time when you need to use a credential. Does that make sense? That's a top tower attack. So that's another thing I haven't mentioned that we should know. Uh, blockchain. Yeah, so look, we've talked a lot about blockchain and we make jokes about it. Do you guys want to know how it works or does everyone sort of know how it works? I mean, is it worth spending 10 minutes explaining blockchain or is everyone confident with blockchain? What do you, what do you want? Yeah, you could do with an explanation. Yeah. All right. Um, can I just have a thumbs up if anyone's interested? Let's do it. Woohoo! Out of mind. <laughs> Don't do it. Oh, I've got some thumbs up. Okay, so we'll do it. So those of you that already know blockchain, um, you're probably going, oh, no, more blockchain. But it is good to understand how it works. So the challenge is, can I keep it to under five minutes? Let's go. Can someone start a very, very slow timer? please? Uh, so a blockchain. What's the idea of blockchain? So, well, let's talk about Bitcoin. So blockchain is a nice solution to the Bitcoin problem. The Bitcoin problem is this. How can I have digital money? What's money? Well, if you think about it, money is this sort of anonymous unit. So I, Chandler and I, in the old days, I could say, Chandler, I'll clean your house. And Chandler can say, I'll build you a piece of furniture to solve your COVID problem. Um, and that would be bartering or exchange. I would tidy his house. He would build me the furniture. It's a reciprocal thing. We don't need any intermediaries or anything funny at all. It's just this direct real world thing. But once we've got a big, more complex economy, it doesn't work like that. Like, I'm really good at cleaning. <laughs> uh, I've never said those words before. And um, But maybe Chandler's house doesn't need cleaning, but maybe lots of other people's houses do. And maybe I need to clean 100 houses to get enough, money, to get enough value that to a piece of furniture would be worth. So the idea is I clean their houses and they give me money, which is gold coins or something. And then I can take those exchangeable units and give them to Chandler and he can make the furniture for me. So... <clears throat> That idea works if you have some non-counterfeitable, fakeable, physical object that I can exchange my value for. Uh, now, the idea of blockchain is, well, what if we don't? Can we do that virtually? 
Now notice we could do that virtually, and we already do do that virtually with our banks. I give them my money to the bank or my pay goes into the bank and the bank says, I promise I'll look after that money for you. And I can use my app and it tells me how much money I've got in my bank account. And I can go to an ATM machine and type in a pin number and it gives me the money I need out of my account. So it seems to have solved that problem where we didn't need actual cash. We could just have ATM machines and pin numbers and things like that. But what's the problem? Does anyone want to say? Trust. Thank you, Tim. I have that. Yeah, I have to trust the bank. And if you can't trust the bank, and I know the idea is crazy, but if you couldn't trust the bank, then nothing works. So we need what we call a trusted third party. Two of us can do something if we have a trusted third party. But trusted third parties are in short supply in the world. And, um, and as we've seen, actually with COVID, someone you trust can suddenly turn out not to be trustworthy. And again, I go back to that quote that I keep saying from the Thomas Crown Affair. When could you trust someone? I guess I could trust someone when their interests don't diverge too much from my own. But if their interests diverge a lot from my interests, then we've got a problem. So for example, we've read, probably all read the stories about how um, uh, someone, I think it might've even been Australia, ordered a whole lot of things, maybe they were respirator machines or something, and they, um, they paid for them and they looked for them and they're on their way. And then suddenly someone from America came in and paid lots more money and bribed them. And then they turned up to going to America and not to Australia. So we did a handshake. I gave you the money. You said to me, give me the thing. I trusted you. Yeah, but someone from America came and gave me more money. So, but, or America, I trusted you to look after this. Yeah, but you know, and you sort of, the problem is arising here because it's massively in America's interest to get the machine and it's massively in the Chinese manufacturer's interest to get as much money as possible. So here we've got a conflict of interest and conflicts of interest are always difficult. So could we have digital money in a world where we don't have trust, where we don't have to trust someone, where it can't suddenly be that, um, someone goes untrustworthy and they say, yeah, I guess you gave me all your salary. Thanks very much, but we're bankrupt now. Bye. Um, so how, how, and the bank could disappear and just take all our money or deny that I had the money there or whatever. So how can we do it without trust? So um, the uh, idea of blockchain is how can we somehow not have to trust someone? But if you don't trust someone, uh, and like, then isn't everything chaos? Everyone could just lie. I mean, how do we deal without trust? So one way of trust-free, I love trust-free protocols, by the way, they're really lovely. One my mum used to come up with for us when we were children was um, I'd say, uh, uh, you know, she'd say, here's the Easter egg. I'll, there's one left over, we'll break it in half and you can each have half. And she would say, uh, Richard, you break it in half, Richard's brother, you pick which half you want. The you cut, I choose protocol. That protocol works even if mum's not there. Because if one of us cuts and the other one chooses, there's no arbiter needed. It's in both of our interests now to make the division as fair as possible. If I don't make the division when I cut it as fair as possible, I'm gonna be lumbered with the smallest one. And the person that then chooses which one to take, uh, if they don't pick the biggest, uh, you know, well, no, actually, uh, Actually, it just needs the first person. But the second one will act to optimize our interests. It is genius, Alexander. Um, and so a fun puzzle for you, and this is a romantic puzzle for, for me, because it was the night of our wedding, and my wife and I had gone up to a wonderful place called the Victoria and Albert in the Blue Mountains and Mount Vic. Uh, and we were going to have our honeymoon. Well, our, not our honeymoon, our collapse and exhaustion after getting married. And, and we were up there, and we went for a beautiful walk in the bush the next day, and it was snowing. And suddenly she mentioned the you cut, I chose protocol. And this idea came to me and it's the, one of the best ideas I've ever had, which is, I wonder if you could do that with three people somehow. I, want, I wonder how you could, could you have an arbiterless cake dividing protocol with three people? And we debated it and thought, talked about it and tried to work it out. And by the end of the honeymoon, we'd worked out a three person, you cut, I choose protocol that would fairly divide a cake amongst three people regardless of their value function. So even if they all value different things, one person really likes the icing and one person really likes the crumb. At the end of this execution of this protocol, you, no one would feel that they had a less than a third of the value by their own measure of value. It's, and I was teaching primary school kids at the time. So I set it as a challenge and it became a staple of my teaching of primary school kids and high school kids, um, the maths kids. Can you come up with a protocol that does this fairly? And everyone thinks they can, but the challenge is um, you, you've got to actually be diabolical and you security students would be that. Uh, imagine um, 
diabolical things happen. You know, uh, uh, don't just assume everyone's honest. Assume it is trust-free and people will um, do the best they can to get the biggest piece. Uh, so if you can come up with that protocol, that's really fun. I wonder if you can generalize it beyond three. You know, I never even tried to do that. I bet you can. I bet you could. That's really interesting. Have to think about that. Now I've got a new fun problem. So Arbitalist protocols are good. That's what we want for our new digital money. We want something Arbitalist. And something else we'd quite like is the anonymity. Because the nice thing about cash is it's anonymous. So if I go and buy a particular book with my credit card, then that purchase is tied to me. But if I walk into a bookshop and buy the book with cash, that purchase is not tied to me. So me, being obsessive about privacy, takes all my money out as cash at the beginning of each week, and I just use cash during the week until the government makes it illegal, which they're trying to do at the moment. It's very nice and it's anonymous. Why do I want it to be anonymous? Because early on I did consulting for a large company who shall remain nameless that had a loyalty program and I suddenly got to see all the data they were collecting on all the people and I realized, oh good grief, I don't want them to ever know what I buy at any shop because they're building up a profile and they will never delete it. And they will sell it to other people with have now too. So I use cash, that's just me being paranoid. So it would be nice if the digital thing also had privacy on it as well or had some sort of anonymity. And it sort of does with blockchain, sort of doesn't. So now we've set up the problem and luckily it's taken way less than five minutes. Now we can tell you how it works. Here's the idea. We come up with a puzzle that's hard to solve because it takes work. Now, normally that's hard for people to understand, but in security, we understand that completely. That's our land. We live in the land of work. We know everything can be cracked. It's just a matter of how much work. And we put all our effort into measuring how much work it would be to crack something. And that's our measure of how secure something is. So there is a blockchain puzzle and to solve it takes work and work is time and computing power, more computing power, less time, less computing power, more time, but computing power costs money. So you have to invest a lot. So there's no magic knob. Someone can turn up and suddenly do a whole heap of work. Work is like friction that takes real time in the real world to do. And this is how we're going to make the thing work. And I say, we, I can't claim any credit for this at all. Satoshi. So um, how does it work? Well, let me tell you an example of the puzzle, which is very similar to the puzzle. You know about hashing. You can take any file you want and hash it. And say if you hashed it with a 128 bit hash, like SHA 128, you'll get a essentially random number that's 128 bits long. How often will that number end in a zero rather than a one? How often will a hash end in a zero? Yes, you're all right. Everyone said it as once. Laura or Lauren? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, uh, it will end in a zero half the time because like a, a random number and it'll end in a one half the time. So how often if you hash something, will it end in two zeros? A quarter of the time. How often will it end in three zero? An eighth of the time. How often will it end with N zeros? One in two to the eight. So if I wanted to make it one in a million chance, of ending in um, a certain number of zeros, I would need to have how many zeros? Think about it. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. This is a great exam question. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. If the Three, chance would be one to make 10. 10, 10, let's think. Two to the 10 is, no, two to the 10 is not big enough. Two to the 10 is, uh, a thousand, isn't it? Is a thousand. Yeah, so if I wanted it to be one in a million, 20. Two to the 20. Well done. That's it. So if I said to you, hash something, does it end in 20 zeros? Only one millionth of the time will you say yes. And the rest of the time you'll say no. So here's the puzzle. I've got a letter or a document. Let's call it a block. I've got a block which has information in it. I'd like you to hash that block and I'd like it to end in 20 zeros. Well, you hash it, and lo and behold, it doesn't. So I say, hmm, okay, at the end of the block, let's suppose the last 100 bits are added to the message. So you've got a block with a whole lot of text in it and information. At the end of the block, add 100 bits of random ones and zeros. To everyone, to everyone, can you please repeat the puzzle? What puzzle? 
everyone to everyone. Ask me the puzzle with words. Ask me your question. Like the, um, you have the block and it has some information in it. Like what you're describing right now, I think is what they mean. But they want me to repeat something. I missed. Okay. I'll say it again. Um, I'll, I'll go back. Uh, if you hash a file, say a text file, so you wrote me a letter and I hashed it with SHA-128, it deterministically will give me a hash value. And anyone in this room could hash it with SHA-128, you'd get the same hash value. It's entirely deterministic. But it's also sort of random in that there's really no way of predicting what that's gonna be from the input text. You can't look at the text and say, oh, that's probably gonna be an answer with a whole lot of ones in it. You know, as far as you're concerned, until you do the hash, it's a complete surprise what the hash is gonna be. And it doesn't change over time. It'll always be that hash. So if I said to you, what's the chance that that, you write me a letter and I hash it, what's the chance that that letter, that hash, sorry, will end in a zero? So the hash is a number, it's 128 bits long. What's the chance that the last bit is a zero? Well, half the time it will be, half the time it won't be. So I'd say 50% chance. What about we just take a random poem by T.S. Eliot and we type it up in text and we hash it. What's the chance that will end in two zeros? That hash value. The chance is one in four. So we'd have to hash four of his poems on average until we got, um, oh, I don't know, on average, one in four. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm mixing my words there a little bit. There's a one in, how many would you have to do of something that has a one in four chance until there's a 50% chance that you've done it? No, well, it's roughly half, so let's say. Um, so you'd probably have to do, um, uh, two poems on average, two, uh, oh, two and a half. Oh, that's confusing, isn't it? Anyway, the chance of, let's not say we do it until we get one. Let's just say I hash two of his poems. Each of those has a one in four chance of ending in two zeros. If I hashed a million of his poems, though he didn't write that many, unfortunately, then um, although each individually would have they'd all have different hashes. And although each hash would only have a one in four chance of ending in two zeros out of doing it a million times, I'd expect roughly uh, a quarter of those million hashes would end in two zeros. Yep. So the puzzle I think that you're asking me to repeat is, um, how, uh, let's not hash a poem. Let's hash just a random piece of text and let's call that, or not rant, a piece of text that I'm not yet saying what is in that piece of text. And let's call that piece of text a block. If you were to hash a block, then it's just like hashing anything with the same sort of apparently random outcome with the hash function. What if at the end of the block, you've written the block, I let you stick 100 bits at the end of the block. So maybe the block is a T.S. Eliot poem, but then you can stick a hundred bits. You could just change those hundred bits. How many combinations, how many different values could you stick in those hundred bits? Well, two to the hundred. How big is two to the hundred? It's ridiculously big. I shouldn't have even said a hundred bits. If you just had 20 bits, you could have a million different combinations. So let's just say you had 20 bits at the end of your message or at the end of your poem. Well, then one poem, can generate a million messages. There's the poem followed by 20 bits of zero. And then there's a fo poem followed by uh, uh, 19 bits of zero and a one. And there's a poem. So you can just generate lots and lots of different poems by putting different bits at the end of the poem, different bits of padding at the end of the poem. Now, the puzzle is this. I want the hash of the poem plus the bits you're sticking at the end. I want that hash to end in zeros. Maybe I want it to end in 10 zeros. So there's one in a thousand chance it will. So you'll have to try a thousand different combinations of padding until by luck. Oh, well, on average, you'll have to try 500. Uh, no, 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 I'm getting caught by that again. Let's just avoid that. You'll have to try a lot of different combinations until by luck, you find one that ends in uh, 10 bits. So that's the puzzle you have to solve for blockchain, which is they say there's some parameter, let's call it K, get the block, which has all the data in it that we're trying to verify then stick some bits on the end, then hash it. When it's hashed, it has to end in K zeros. The outcome of the hash end to end in K zeros. So if K is 30, you have to end with 30 zeros, 30 zero bits. 
what's the chance of a hash ending in 30 zero bits? That's one in a billion. So you would have to try on average half a billion hashes until you found one. And because hashes appear to be random, you can't cleverly pick the bits to put on to get the right hash value. Instead, you just try one, then you try the next one, and you try the next one, and you try the next one. And trying each time, let's be clear, involves computing a hash, an SHA 128 hash. And that might not be very fast to do. So you've got to do a lot of work. Does that make sense? And that's the work you've got to do. That's a puzzle you've got to do. A block is only accepted into this chain of blocks called the blockchain if its hash of the block has the right number of zeros at the end. So what happens is everyone's trying to find the next block to put in the blockchain for various reasons, and they're all racing and they're trying hashes as fast as they can, and that's called mining. And they've got lots of computers or PlayStations or hacked machines working furiously, just hashing, 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 consuming a ridiculous amount of the world's energy running all these computers until someone shouts, I've got the golden ticket, yay! I've suddenly found a hash of the block. If I put, I don't know, if I write um, uh, um, uh, yellow brick road at the end of the block, lo and behold, the hash has all the zeros at the end. That was the magic key I needed to find. Woohoo, I found it. And the first person to find it sticks it onto the end of the chain. And that has added one more block to the blockchain. And then everyone tries now races to find the next one. And because uh, each, <laughs> each block includes a whole lot of data that you're trying to uh, include in the blockchain. So there's this, un this is, uh, and then everyone shares the blockchain. So it's distributed. Uh, so the, uh, everyone's trying to, everyone's <laughs> you got a lot of block information. Here's where I'm losing it suddenly. <laughs> Let me calm down and get happy. Um, although um, the act of, <clears throat> let's take a step back, Richard. We've talked about the game. Now let's talk about how it relates to blockchain. I've got a whole lot of information I want to add to the blockchain. The information I want to add is the information everyone wants to add, which is the information about what is it we're trying to assure here. So if I've just cleaned your floor and you've given me 10 bucks worth of value to do it, maybe a half a Bitcoin or something like that, you write something saying, I owe Richard 10 bucks and you put it in the blockchain. You put it in a block. And you give it to someone saying, can you add this to the blockchain? And they're working like crazy with their mining, trying to find a way of, with your text in the block, getting that block added to the blockchain. And lots of other people have also come along and put their bits of text to put in the block as well. So maybe they've made a block with 50 transactions or 100 transactions or 1,000 transactions in it. And they're just frantically trying to find a hash that works. And as soon as they do, then they publish that to everyone that gets put in the blockchain. Now, what happens now is... The person that has to build the next block starts, their block starts with the hash of the last block. And then it has a whole lot of transactions added to it. And then they put the padding and then they rehash that. So the next block, because it contains the hash of the last block, it actually forms an integrity check on the last block. So someone can't later on claim, oh yeah, you said the 17th block said Richard owed you 10 bucks. But actually I think the 17th block said Richard owed you two bucks and no one can say that because if they change the content of the block then that changes the hash value of the block and it won't end on all these lovely zeros and it also that hash value was incorporated into the next block and the next block's been accepted by everyone so you'd have to change to the next block as well you'd have to recompute that and if there's now seven blocks in the chain, but by the time you want to do the faking you'd have to recompute every one of those subsequent ones but the point is that takes a lot of effort and energy to do and you can't race the people who are doing it because they put all available power into going as fast as they can. And you can't possibly be faster than them um, because they're working like buggery. And why are they working so hard and quickly to get the next block in? Because every time you put a block to the blockchain, you get paid a small amount of Bitcoin. That's how Bitcoin's created. A small amount of payment to a miner for creating the new block. So they're paid in a sense to verify and assure the integrity of the previous transactions. Whew. That is a quick summary of blockchain. How is that? Who pays the miner? Uh, who pay, no, um, no one does. Uh, it, it's like quantitative easing. Um, the way the Bitcoin currency works is if you are the miner and you create the block and it's got your credential in it, then you get, everyone accepts, you get a certain amount of block Bitcoin for doing it. The amount of Bitcoin you get 
paid for mining decreases over time in accordance with some formula, but it's a known and accepted formula. So as soon as you can prove you created the block, then you've got the Bitcoin. And in fact, I imagine, and here's where I should know more details about the blockchain. I imagine you even put a transaction in the block yourself saying, I get these Bitcoins because I made the block. And once you've verified the block and everyone accepts it, then you're done. Ha ha ha. So, um, yeah, so the miners get paid a little bit of money for doing it and they go as fast as they can. That's how the new coins are made. Um, everything's slowing down. As computing power increases and it gets easier to solve the puzzle, then the K, the number of zeros you've got to find, just increases. And the idea is they do a rebalancing every period of time. I can't remember how often it is um, to make sure it takes about 10 minutes to compute a new block. So if people find more compute power, then you just got to find more zeros. It's like a log function. It's exactly like that. If only we'd seen log functions. I think the whole world has seen log functions for the first time. I think we know log functions really well now. Um, okay, uh, does that, uh, uh, read this Richard. Read what? I can only see the comment that says read this. So intriguing. Can I not read it now? Can I read it at the end of the lecture though? But I will find it. Thank you, Michael. Um, so that was a super quick summary of blockchain and notice it used hashing. That's the interesting thing I wanted to tell you. It uses integrity checking, um, hashing for integrity checking, and it uses concepts of, of work and it uses concepts of trustlessness. And the example that I always like to think is when I used to give my girls pocket money, I'd never give them the actual money because they'd lose it. So instead we had something called the calendar and on the calendar, I would write daughter number one, cause that's what I called her. I'm not very inventive. I know Darth, uh, Darth gets um, 10 bucks for this. And I'd write the date and I'd squiggle my signature next to it. So she couldn't fake it. Uh, and uh, not that she would. And the calendar was our repository of information. And what was ever written on a calendar month, that was all the transactions that month. And if she paid me a bit of money back, I'd write it on the calendar. And if I took some off, I'd write it on the calendar. And then whenever anyone said, oh, dad, you owe me 10 bucks, I'd say, well, let's look on the calendar. And the calendar had the up-to-date thing uh, of, of how much everyone owed. So the calendar was this great idea. And that is just like a block. It is a ledger that keeps track of all the transactions. So everyone could compute at any given instant how much they were owed by who. Now, this ledger required trust. She had to trust that I wouldn't fake it. But if we both signed it, then maybe it wouldn't require so much trust. Though the attack I could still do if we both signed is I guess I could rip a page out. I can't add things, but I can delete things. Um, so how could we stop me doing that sort of attack? Well, what we'd have to do is copy the calendar and have lots of copies of it held by everyone in sight. And then if my copy was different to everyone else's, we could do some sort of voting. And that's the idea of a distributed ledger. Um, lots of copies of the blockchain, of the ledger, the, block, the, the ledger is the blockchain, are held and anyone who wants can get a copy of it, though most people don't bother getting it. It's pretty ridiculously big by now. Um, and then if there's a dispute, then there's a protocol, there's an arbitrary mechanism for working out which of the version is the authoritative version that we all believe in. And it's very simple, actually. It's whichever one is longer. Okay, uh, so that is blockchain and Bitcoin, super fast. 51% uh, tax, yeah, yeah, there. People are talking about all the attacks. You should read up about attacks on it. But yeah, look, if you could take this over, it's basically relying on the fact of everyone being honest and, uh, and no, no one being honest, everyone competing with each other. But what if people colluded? Like, what if a whole lot of miners got together and together they had more than 50% of the compute power in the world devoted to Bitcoin mining? And that's happened actually now in pools. There are big pools that have more than 50% of the compute power for different currencies. So if you have more than 50% of the compute power, you can go back and fake transactions and then refake all and then compute new um, uh, blocks and sign new blocks going forward uh, as, as far back as your extra compute power allows you. Um, and no one can beat you then because the rule is whoever's got the longest chain wins. So you can actually change the blockchain uh, if you have more than 50% compute power. Um, so it is actually a bit dangerous. Uh, and there's all sorts of other possible attacks on blockchain too. Uh, it's, it's trustless in this really weird uh, sense that we sometimes have of uh, uh, the torch issue. <laughs> the problem we were initially worrying about, what if the person with the ledger changed it? Well, we've solved that problem. We haven't solved lots of other problems. Like for example, the people that look after Bitcoin that make all the rules that write the software, uh, who trusts them? Uh, you know, there's this, all, the trust has been, it's like, um, you know, when you have, um, when you used to, did you ever used to have to put contact on your books at school to cover them with plastic? Or have you ever uh, laid a carpet and there's a budgie that's got under the carpet and you find that wherever you push the bubble, it just moves to another spot. So we've moved the trust from one thing, but of course there is still trust. Yeah, you might want to do a bit of research to find out where the trust still resides in Bitcoin, because of course there is still trust. We can't get rid of the trust. That's a ridiculous concept, but it's just moved it to an area perhaps where we're more comfortable or, we d or a darker area where we don't look that often. We just trust Satoshi. We trust all the people that look after Bitcoin that they're not going to fake it. All right. Whew. 
that was really long. And now we're at 620. Roll your own Bitcoin. <laughs> Such a good idea. Wasn't I reading recently about some scam? Someone claimed they'd rolled their own Bitcoin, but they didn't actually have any cryptography behind it. But it was at the time that everyone was so excited about Bitcoin because you could just see people making so much money on it, speculating. Um, that was, you can probably guess what that was. I won't tell you, but I bet you know what that was. Um, uh, uh, yeah, there was. Does anyone remember the name of that coin? What was it? Did someone just uh, flick it up? The name of that currency? Uh, Dodge, yeah, Dogecoin, Dogecoin. It was something like that, wasn't it, Kanye coin? Um, and, and actually, it just had no cryptography behind it. And the story I was reading was someone, it is really Dogecoin, that is so funny if it was. Um, the story I was reading behind it was that um, someone was a cryptographer and they asked him to come in and be their cheap cryptographer after the thing had been running for a while and people had been pumping money into it. And he said, well, what sort of blockchain do you use behind it? I said, oh, no, we don't use a blockchain. <laughs> and he suddenly realized, they're just making it up as they go along. Uh, and he said, no, thank you. At that time, it would have been good to sell short that currency. So anyway, that all disappeared. Yes. All right. Um, so this is just our chatty thing, but um, we've done lots of chats. I was going to talk about bugs. I was going to talk about the exam. Let's just talk about bugs because I've got some fun bugs from last week's lecture. I keep nearly doing this every week. Let's just, uh, oh, you can't see. I think I stopped screen sharing. I'm just going to week eight. Let me turn screen sharing back on. How do I do it? Oh, uh, I was so excited by last week's lecture. I did put pictures up of all the books I was talking about. I dug this out again and I was just reading it. Uh, it is so good, man. You've got to read these books. Understanding Comics and Making Comics. Best communication exercise in the world. Here are some examples of some fun puzzles from Mark Dowd's amazing book, um, The Art of uh, uh, Software Security Assessment, which I should find. Hang on, let me show you. Amazing book, amazing, amazing. Mark Dowd, amazing Australian, brilliant, brilliant man. Um, he came to a lecture once. Oh, I was too embarrassed to talk to him. We're not worthy. Such a nice guy and so smart, so amazingly smart. Many funny stories about him that I can't tell you. Um, anyway, he wrote this book with other people. As far as I know, it's the only book he ever wrote. In it, in it, oh yeah, uh, in it. He dropped an O-Day. In one of the examples, he actually includes an O-Day. And it's not till a long time later, like years later, when it was someone actually says, um, oh, here's this O-Day I just found. And he just quietly mentions, oh, actually, that was in a book. I probably, I'll use. He just slipped it in and didn't mention no one had ever seen it before. Oh, so clever. Um, uh, and there were two other books I was going to show you too. Let me show you them. Uh, this is if you want to get prepped for next week. Next week, we're looking at James Reason's book, Human Error. You should get every single thing James Reason's ever read, written, or, or read probably, because it made him who he was, and read it. Amazing man. And Just Culture by Sidney Decker. Um, and last year, well, let me get it. Uh, I was speaking to Lachlan about it, and he said, oh, wasn't that the book that everyone makes fun of? And I'm going, no, it's the good book. So if you read a whole lot of people making fun of that book, go poo to you and read the actual book. It's the most amazing thing. It turned Qantas around uh, and made them... Um, uh, I mean, it absolutely changed their accident record. I mean, it's just absolutely transformative. I was speaking to some pilots about it once. And for them, the book of the Just Culture book is like the Bible. It gives them safety and comfort when they're on a plane, that the plane they're in is safe. And um, I was speaking to some Qantas pilots and some of their test pilots. And one of them said he'd come and give a guest lecture. And I've just realized I never followed him up on it. We should get him definitely one year to come and give a guest lecture because pile, um, it, airplane stuff is really interesting to me because it's got that whole single point of failure and it's also got culture in it. So they have a safety culture there. They're really big on safety culture. And that's what we're looking at next week. Can the security culture learn anything from safety culture? Because safety is a problem that's actually fairly well addressed in engineering circles now, but security is not. So let's, let's lift some lessons from them. So those two books are awesome books. Uh, why was I doing that? Yeah, here's an example from Mark Dowd's book. All right, can anyone spot the bug? Uh, just put your hand up if you spot it. I, I can't remember them, so I have to look at it now too. What is it? What's the bug? It's an amazing bug.
So the user, so all of these bugs are gonna be of the same sort. I mean, we're looking for vulnerabilities here. So um, the challenge is uh, the user can control something. Here's the program, the user can't control the program, but the user is using this program and they want to take control of this program. Is there something in this program that lets the user change something they do have control over, which is the data they're putting in. So is there some way they can turn data into control? Is there some way they can put in data that will give them control over this program? Now, the, the socket here, it's a TCP IP socket, actually, that's funny, uh, or file descriptor, uh, or it might not be actually, a TCP, I don't even know. Um, but let's assume it's a network connection and they're sending data in through the socket ID, uh, SOCFD. Um, and get user length um, is, I guess, telling us that this is something the user has control over. So the user can adjust the control, the user can adjust the length of the input coming in here. Um, so length is how much data the user's pumped in. If the length is greater than 1,024, we abort. And if it's less than 1,024 or equal to it, we read it into the bar. Oh, someone's got it? Oh, Tom, I can't hear you. You sound like a chipmunk. I don't think that was me. Was it me? Uh, I don't think it was me. I don't know. Yeah, is there someone else talking? Uh, I'm talking. Oh, who's that? Michael. Oh, hi, Michael. Where are you? Oh. Are you Michael or Mikey? Mickey. Mickey. Where are you? I can't see you. are not appearing on my screen, but I believe... I've got my, I've got my video off. Oh, okay. Yeah, you've spotted it. What is it? Um, so the buffer is 1024 and it's a character buffer. Yep. But the length is only checked if it's greater than 1024, not equal to. So yeah, you could um, overflow the uh, terminating character. I was wondering if it was a terminator error, but I don't think it is. Uh, that's what I was just checking then. Um, because strings mm -hmm. are often one longer. Uh, but due, 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 if the character is 1024, the buffer does have 1024. So the length includes a terminator, I think. Yeah, so it, it'll read in a, a 1023 characters and then the terminating null byte. Yeah. Yeah, that's so it um, in. But it was good that you looked for an out by one. Tom, have you got it? Is is this like Heartbleed? Ah, yeah, could be, could be. Because it's, I'm assuming the the vuln is like you can set the length, the um, user length to be longer than it actually is, and then read other stuff. Yeah, that's what we're going to try and do here. Um, so I think if the length is ridiculously long, it's a type error here. So we've got signed and unsigned integers. And it looks to me like in this length is int. So that si is the default for an int signed? I think the default is signed. The default for an int is signed, yeah, but it's... you're right. Get user length could conceivably return unsigned. Yeah, get user length returns unsigned. So that's exactly right. You've got it. So um, if you have a ridiculously long thing, so it's bigger than the... No, so signed means... Okay, all the bits except one are used for value and essentially one bit is used to denote the sign. Unsigned is, oh, I know this is gonna be positive. So let me grab that extra bit. This is from the old days of programming where every bit counted when I was a boy. Um, and let's grab that extra bit and actually use that to encode the value as well. So you can, with unsigned, with unsigned things, the values can be twice as big. You've got an extra bit you can use. So if the length of the string coming in is longer than the unsigned max, but less long than the, uh, uh, sorry, longer than the signed max, but less long than the unsigned max, <laughs> if that makes sense. We're in this crazy in-between space. What's gonna happen is that, that large number is gonna get returned by get user length, and it's gonna get put into length. Now, we do all this crazy type promotion and conversion and all sorts of things, and Mark Dow goes into this in great detail in the art of software security. But essentially, that's gonna wrap around and get converted to a negative number. So length is gonna be a negative number. So is length greater than 1,024? No, it's a negative number at this point. Um, but, uh, 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 and then it reads uh, the, the if, ignore that if read thing, that's just wrapping if the read didn't work. Um, then it's just gonna read into the buffer the length. Now, um, the length in this place is an unsigned, it's expecting an unsigned parameter, so it's passed in unsigned, so it reads in a ridiculous amount. Uh, and that ridiculous amount is greater than the size of the buffer, which is 1024. So I've just done a buffer overflow. Does that make sense? It's beautiful. Very nice.
number two. Do you want to do some more of these? Are they fun or not? Thumbs up if you want to do another one or two. Yeah, yeah, let's do a couple more. Let's look at this. The length is greater than zero. The length is greater than or equal to this. And the great thing about the art of software security assessment is it's as good as some of the fundamental C books. It actually goes in great detail about how type promotion works, how length extension works, how all these other, um, how essentially C play all the, you know, the C typing nasties talks about how they're actually implemented in practice. And by exploiting those, you get to do all sorts of nasty things. So what have we got here? If the length is greater than zero and the length is less than the size of something, copy it and we'll copy it in. <laughs> oh, I forgot about this one. This is the best one. Oh, can anyone see this? Anyone, a first year can see this. This is staring you in the face, but somebody should have run one five one one style. Yes, <laughs> that's right. They should have. Uh, is it, this the Apple bug? Uh, uh, there was an Apple bug like this. Yes, yes. In their password verification, wasn't it? Pseudo or something, I think. No, I think it was Apple's password check. Someone inserted a line, I think, and I think it was a password check in Pseudo. But yeah, I could be wrong. But yes, it is that. It is this. Can people see what it is? It's so funny. Oh, Laura, you're laughing. Someone just say. Someone who hasn't said anything so far in the lecture. Memcopy gets executed anyway. Yes. Why does memcopy get executed no matter what? Um, because like um, there's no brackets in the top if statement. And like um, it means that the copied flag will get ex like will get executed if the if the top if statement is true but yeah. because the if statement is not co um, covering mem copy it's going to get executed anyway yeah. perfect perfect you see it that's perfect you said it very clearly this indenting here is just wishful thinking and the c compiler doesn't obey the wishful thinking flag this is not part of the if statement because if an if doesn't have a brace after it and anyone that's coding always, for heaven's sake, put a brace. Python. Lock should be in a, no. And that's why everyone loves Python. So please, please, please. Um, so this isn't inside the if, so it always gets executed. Uh, and we could keep going. But anyway, all the puzzles are there. Why don't I just leave them for you to look at? They are so much immensely fun. But even more fun is to just get this book. Look how fat it is. You are so happy reading this book if you read the book. It's days and days and days of pleasure. All right, let's go back to week nine. All right. You guys are good, by the way. That's really good. Blockchain, bugs, exam. I want to talk about online elections, but look, I think we've sort of run out of time and I do want to leave a bit of time at the end to talk about exams. So let me just now talk about what today's lecture is really supposed to be about. It was just a tiny topic um, and I figured we could chat for a long time before. I want to talk about PKI and the problem of key distribution. We've talked about key distribution before. Um, so, you know, we're in the land of secrets and trust and we know that in theory, everything all works, but just like the bubble in the cover of the textbook or the budgie under the carpet, there are problems. And if we solve a problem somewhere, it normally means we've pushed the problem somewhere else. So let's look to see where we've pushed the problem of trust and how it's dealt with. Um, we know that asymmetric um, uh, cryptography allows us to do this public key thing, which is quite nice and allows people to talk to each other with minimum transfer and management of keys. Very nice. But there is this still minimum amount that has to happen. Let's look at how it happens in practice. All right. How to send keys around. So here's the problem. I am, who am I? I'm Sarah. And I want to go to some website to buy something. A puppy. Puppiesareus.com. And... I have to, I'm um, Sarah and I have to type in my credit card number. And so I want to make sure I really am talking to puppiesareus.com because it would be sucky if I wasn't. How do I know I'm really talking to puppiesareus.com? Um, let's make this real. Actually, Sarah, what is your credit card number? <laughs> um, uh, so, all right, suppose it's Amazon. Let's make it easy. We'll get back to puppiesareus.com later on because that seems a harder problem. What about the Amazon problem? That seems easy. How do I know I'm really talking to Amazon? I'm buying something on the Amazon website. How do I know I'm not sending it to Russian hackers? I really am sending it to Amazon. Well, 
I'm going to do an encrypted conversation with them so no one can eavesdrop on it. And I'm going to have to do cryptography to do that. So let's not worry about the authentication part of it at the moment. Let's just worry about the um, integrity part and the confidentiality part. So we're going to have a stream of data traveling between us and we'll probably use the protocol HTTPS, which is HTTP, but with cryptography wrapped around it, secure sockets or something like that. But essentially it's an encrypted, um, uh, an encrypted protocol. It can only be rendered, read at either end, not by all the people along the way. Um, and there'll be a little padlock that appears telling us that I'm using SS, um, SSL, that I'm using an encrypted TLS, I'm using an encrypted connection. Um, and I, Sarah, I want to send them a credit card number, so I'm going to encrypt it, but I haven't got their public key. I don't know what their public key is. Um, because I've never talked to them before and they don't know my key. But uh, what I do is I connect to them and they send me something saying, here's my public key. I think, yeah, okay. Well, if you are Amazon, that probably is your public key. But if you're not Amazon, you could be someone else sending me. It's like that old problem I used to have when I read the Bible. And I'd say at Bible study, uh, yeah, but how do I know it's all true? I mean, what if some bits are true and aren't, some aren't? You know, what if the human intervention in writing down the story changed some of the truth? And everyone would always say, no, no, look at this bit here. Uh, Paul says, or someone says, everything in the Bible is true. Yeah, the whole thing is God's word. And I'd say, ah, yeah, yeah, uh, uh-huh, but because already a uh, new security. I said, so if I believe him, then I believe him. But if I don't believe him, I don't, you know, how, how yeah, he could be sending me a fake certificate here claiming that it's all true. How do I actually know that he, what he's saying is true? So how do I actually know that at the certificate that claims to come from Amazon is really Amazon certificate? Well, this is the million dollar question. Now we're going to look at how we're going to solve that question. And then we'll get back to puppiesrus.com after that, which is possibly a slightly harder question. So we need to send keys around and we need to be able to get hold of keys and we need to be able to get keys of people we haven't spoken to. And we need to know they're the right keys and they haven't been altered with and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. So on. And we need to do all that for e-commerce. So how's e-commerce going to work? We need a way of doing it. And then here's Horton Hatches the Egg. He's, now this is a great book by Dr. Seuss. And you should really all read Dr. Gee, I should have put Dr. Seuss on the reading. There's all sorts of interesting things about Dr. Schuess. He's this amazing guy, an amazing, amazing educator. And, and you should read about him. He's truly a remarkable man. But he wrote this book. He wrote two books about Horton. Horton, he's a who, and Horton hatches the egg. And in Horton hatches the egg, there is um, a bird that has laid an egg and doesn't really want to hang around looking after the egg. And Horton is worried because he knows if the egg isn't sat on, then the chick won't be able to live and hatch. So the bird goes away and Horton agrees that he will sit on the egg for as long as needed until the, chick come, the bird comes back. He's very nice. Now, um, uh, and then he keeps, it takes quite a while. I seem to remember years pass and there's snow and leaves blowing over him and, and the bird's just off having all sorts of fun. And he's sitting on the egg and he keeps thinking, maybe I've sat on the egg enough now. And then he says, and this is the line he always says, I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. Actually, when Dr. Seuss died, uh, he was just the most amazing man. Everyone around the world did tributes for him. And most people did it in the same meter <laughs> that he used to write his books in. So there's tributes from American presidents. And, you know, he did, he was very anti-Hitler and, and spoke out a lot against uh, the bad things Hitler was doing. So, you know, he's just very dearly loved around the world. So uh, anyway, I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. In security, and this is one of the reasons I love security, that is called the Horton Principle. And the Horton Principle is something that we uh, try and do whenever we come up with a cryptographic protocol. The Horton Principle is you should, you should say what you mean, you should check what you check. You shouldn't check something that's a proxy for what you mean, you should check what you mean. So for example, to make it more concrete, in the blockchain, the hash we store is the hash of the block. So if we're authenticating something, the thing we're authenticating is the thing uh, in doing the integrity check on is the actual thing we care about. And a talk tau error is an example of these two things misaligning when there it's a temporal misalignment where you're checking something and then you're using something and the check and the use misalign in time. But um, the Horton principle is more about not misaligning what you're checking. So if I did all this elaborate checking on your password, but then 
don't know, did some crazy hash on it and the hash was actually used to let you into the system, then it doesn't really matter all the checking I did on the password because I should have been checking the hash. So our idea here is it's very easy to put a lot of effort into protecting something, but that thing is not the thing you really care about. So the Horton principle is um, mean what you say, say what you mean. If, the thing, if you want to check something, then check literally the thing you're checking. Don't check some sort of proxy for it. And we get the Horton, the Horton principle, unfortunately, has been a bit violated in PKI. And PKI is the solution we use to give us internet commerce, to allow us to exchange keys at scale. Now, how can we exchange keys? There's two sort of general approaches people have come up with. One is we could have in a centralized authority-based, a command and control type approach. <clears throat> That's PKI. That's the one that won. The other one that didn't win was we could have a decentralized peer-based approach. That's like PGP, like blockchain. This is a bit looking a bit better now. I guess blockchain's getting a bit of a thing. Um, all the web of trust sort of stuff. This is an idea where you're authenticated not by a single trusted person, but by a whole network of things that are hard to fake in various ways. And you have to replace that tr trust like the cake problem with something else. You can't just have nothing. Um, so what we adopted was the PKI approach because it, I think, it just looks similar to how we do things in practice and companies are familiar with it and it looks comfortable and we like trusting. So everyone trusts. So here's how it works in practice. I want to buy the puppy. I'm Sarah. Amazon sends me their password, but they don't send me the password. They send it wrapped up in a document, which is called a certificate. It's called actually an X.509 certificate. Is that's a particular standard they use for how they write and encode and encapsulate and lay out the certificate. But anyway, they send me a certificate and I'm Sarah. I check the certificate and I try and decide if the certificate is valid or not. And what has happened to the certificate is the certificate has on it a hash that means it hasn't been altered. And then the whole thing, including the hash is signed. And I think we've talked about signing, haven't we? Have I talked about signing before? Do you guys know roughly how to sign things? Have I done it? Say yes or no. Say no if I haven't. I suddenly can't remember if we got up to the end of the lecture and I didn't do it. Someone, no one's saying yes. No one's saying no. No, okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, uh, you know how to use RSA. Here's a, a naive way of how to sign, but the general principle is the same. You know how RSA works? We have two keys, a public key and a private key. And we talked before about, because they're raising things to power, you could actually use them in either order. So although in practice, how you do it is you encrypt something with someone's public key and they decrypt it with the private key. I think we mentioned in passing, it would also work to go the other way. You could encrypt it with your private key and then someone could decrypt it with your public key. Now you might think, what's the point of that? That's pretty stupid. That means only one person can encrypt it, but everyone can decrypt it. Surely that's the opposite of what you want with cryptography. And yes, it is but it's uh, with confidentiality it is, but with integrity and authentication, it's exactly what we want. So only one person could do it, that's authentication, but everyone can check it, that's authentication. So I get a message and I encrypt it with my private key and then I show it to the world. Anyone in the world that has my public key can decrypt it and check that it matches what I'm claiming it is. And because I'm the only one that knows in the world that knows my private key, that means the message definitely came from me. So it is signed by me. And because it's an encryption, you can't change anything in the document at all because that wouldn't change the whole encryption and it wouldn't work. So it's also giving you an integrity check at the same time. So if I was to sign something with my private key and send it to you, encrypt it with my private key, I could also send it in plain text as well. So you could get the plain text and the encrypted version, though to save time, I might as well just send you the encrypted version, I guess. Uh, you would decrypt it with my public key and you would know that it's come from me because I'm the only one that knows my private key and you'd know no one's altered it in transit because if they'd altered it, it wouldn't decrypt properly. So that is one way you could do signing. Now that very simplistic way is open to some attacks, but that's the general idea of how signing works with public key authentication. And you might want to look up DSS. Um, no, sorry, DSA, the digital signature algorithm, the way that people do digital signatures is normally something like DSA. Um, okay, so let's suppose Amazon did the naive thing and let's not worry about it. So um, Amazon signed, uh, so uh, not Amazon, because we don't know if we can trust Amazon. Who can we trust? Can someone just say someone you can trust? You gotta pick one person that you can trust. Certificate authority. 
Yeah, but give me someone's name that you can trust. Thomas Kuntz. Richard Buckland. Yeah, oh, from the Bible. Me. You can never trust me. Please don't trust me. And you certainly can't trust Tom. Uh, uh, but Tom, I mean, it's the same as you can't trust me. We, we can't. I mean, I can trust me. Yes, yes. Well, actually, uh, yeah. And you are lucky because I can't even trust me. We had this delicious, enormous Easter egg and I decided I wasn't going to have any. It's all gone. I cannot explain it except for there's a roughly Easter egg sized bit of guilt sitting inside me at the moment. So, yeah. I'm not even trustworthy because my interests don't always align with my own. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, who's someone we can trust? Just pick someone. And I know you're all wanting to say Scott Morrison. So let's say that the Australian government, let's say the Australian government, we can trust the Australian government. Or Donald whoa, Trump. whoa, whoa. No, no, That's on. exactly the group of people trying to break encryption. Okay. Let's pick some, ah, Google. Okay. We can trust Google. So suppose we can trust Google. What we do is we all know Google's, public key. That's something that we all know from birth. It's told to everyone. Suppose we all know it. Let's not worry yet how we know it. Then when I connect, and I'm Sarah, so let's say Sarah, when Sarah connects to Amazon, sorry, Sarah, I keep becoming you, but we'll let you be you. Yeah. When Sarah connects to Amazon, Amazon sends her a certificate that's encrypted with Google's private key. Sarah decrypts it with Google's public key. And lo and behold, the certificate makes sense and she can read it and she knows this came from Google. Google signed this. Google said this is correct. And inside the certificate, like an Easter egg, inside the Easter egg is Amazon's public key. And Google is promising this is Amazon's public key. So Sarah says, I trust Google. So I'm trusting this key is Amazon's public key. So now I'm going to use it as the basis of my communication with Amazon. And she does. And now it all works perfectly. That is how it works. Now, the person you trust, as someone said, it might have been Yanis, was it? I can't remember who said it. We call that person the certificate authority. And the document that was sent, we call a certificate or a PKI certificate or a digital certificate or a public key certificate or, you know, lots of different names for it. And the certificate authority is the person we trust to tell us whose public key is whose. Now, how do we know the certificate authority key? because we need to be able to decode the message that came from them and check their signatures, right? Well, luckily, whenever you get a web browser, it comes with a whole lot of certificates preloaded. A whole lot of certificate authority certificates are in it already. And you can see it. I'm going to do it now on Chrome. I don't know. You can see my Chrome window, I'm guessing. No, you can't even see that. I'm going Chrome, because I'm using Chrome for this lecture, believe it or not. Preferences. You follow along in Chrome or follow along on your own browser. I'm trying to... We can see this. Oh, you can see it? Yeah, just don't type your password in. Oh, you, you, could, you can see it all along? You've always been able to see it? Oh, man. You're on settings and I can see that it says, get Google smart oh, that's fantastic. Chrome. So let's have a look. So where is it? Does anyone know where the data is? It's probably in advanced. Autofill passwords. <laughs> uh, system maybe? No. Does anyone know where Google keeps their certificates? Privacy and security. It's going to be in there, isn't it? Search engine default browser, languages, download. Oh, does anyone know where it is? Bloody hell. Sometimes you can just click on the bar itself. You're viewing a secure Google Chrome page. Sometimes yeah, Richard. I can see the actual certificate. Does anyone know where the certificate store is? Someone said Richard. Who is it? Yeah, I think you have to go to a web page. <laughs> go to a web um, page. Yeah. No, no, no. Hit example. There are some comments in the chat. Are they? Can someone tell me? Because I never use Chrome. I'm just using it for the lecture. You can probably just search it where it says search settings. Ah, it says search settings. Thank you. Uh, what's it called? A certificate store? I'm just going to say search. Click on more and have it. Allow sites to check. Oh, it's got all the default settings. Manage certificates. Woohoo! Okay. Here are all my certificates. And the system roots is in. Now we can't see that. Oh, can't you? Oh, it's probably a good thing. All right. <laughs> Come, uh, I wonder how I can share it. Let me do share. Your screen is very zoomed in, I think. Let me, let me find. Let me stop sharing this window and I can open my sub window. Can I share the sub window? Ah, 
here, keychain access, that doesn't work. I know, I want you to see that. No, that is my actual keychain. What's that doing up there? That wasn't very clever. Can you see it now? No. Oh, anyway. We, we can see the whole screen now. But you can't see the certificate. I've just opened on it. Anyway, uh, I wonder how I can, I can't show you this. Um, Richard? Logically incapable. But if you go to your own browser, you can open it up now and I can tell you there are page after page after page of certificates in here. They are all the certificate authorities. So they're all the people that I trust to sign certificates. Um, Richard? Yes. Those certificate authorities, they, the, their certificates need to be updated periodically, don't they? <laughs> well, you would think so. In the old days, there's a revocation. There's, a, there's something in the protocol that allows you to revoke a certificate authority. But Microsoft and most of the lazy early implementers didn't bother putting that part of the protocol in. So once you got a certificate, say, into your what's it called, Internet Explorer, there was no way of getting it out. And, you know, they eventually uh, got caught by that because someone made a fake Microsoft certificate. <laughs> they were able to sign things as Microsoft. And then um, and Microsoft couldn't revoke it because they hadn't bothered to implement the revoking thing. Very funny. Was previous certificate just to validate it? Say again? When the certificates are updated, I assume the previous certificate is used to validate it? Uh, I don't even know how certificates are uh, updated. I think you just get what you get and you don't get upset. And maybe when the web browser is updated, it probably just throws away all the old certificates and puts a new one in and it probably just checks it all with the Chrome or Firefox or Microsoft key that it's a valid thing. But basically, right. here's the thing. When you've got a browser, you are trusting whatever the browser says are the trusted people. So when I asked you before, who do you trust? I was asking the wrong people. You don't have any say in it who you trust. You trust whoever Firefox decides you should trust, whoever Microsoft decides you should trust. Guess what? Google trusts Google. Microsoft trusts Microsoft, perhaps foolishly, as we found in the past. Um, how do you get Microsoft or Google or Firefox or someone like that to trust you? How do you get them to add your certificate? How do you do it? Do you have to be super trustworthy? There's a Darknet Diaries episode on this. I'll, oh, see, is if I can I'll see if I can find the number. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll tell you the answer. You pay them money. If you give them money, they put your certificate there as a certificate authority. So we've had government, or the government tells them to, and they put it in. So governments, we've lots of examples of governments putting in certificate authorities. And the crazy thing about it is the certificate authority can verify anyone. So your the government can if you're an oppressive regime, and we've seen examples of this with Iran, for example, and Saudis have done this, um, or, uh, allegedly, um, uh, they've managed to get uh, fake certificates into people's browsers in their own country, into the certificate store, and then they've essentially been able to man in the middle of them. So when the people try and connect to the outside world and connect to some trusted site to download software or something like that, they go to a fake Saudi site, uh, and, and, but the Saudi certificate authority certifies that it's, or whoever it is, uh, you know, lots of countries have done this. Let's be, let's be honest. Um, uh, uh, they, they trust it. So what does that padlock mean? Well, it means encryption is going on, but it doesn't mean you're necessarily talking to the right people. You're talking to someone that a certificate authority, one of your 9 million certificate authorities that come free with your browser. Now you're welcome to delete and edit those. Anyone you don't trust. Has anyone ever gone in and done it? No, and companies can ask you to add them in. So UNSW has probably asked you to add them in, um, uh, especially if they want to read your encrypted traffic. And man, in the middle, you deliberately, or your school probably does. If you ever went to a school and they said, give us your laptop over the weekend, we're installing the school security software on it. One of the first things they'll do is put in a bodgy certificate on. So now they can claim anything is anything. And then they'll use that to read all your encrypted traffic. Otherwise, I can't read HTTPS stuff. Um, your phone can have it. And if you're MDM'd on the phone, if you've got management running on the phone, I don't, I haven't actually looked at what you can do under management on phones, but I assume they can fit around with the certificate store. So, um, so basically you're just trusting whoever you're told to trust and we don't ever undo it. So there's a whole lot of problems with PKI and that's just one of them. There are many others and Bruce Schneier, our hero who we love, um, has written a really good article on it. And there's a, it sounds like there's a dark, good darknet episode on this. You could talk about problems with PKI forever because it's just trust and we want to trust people, but actually um, just notice you, you're just moving from one sort of trust to another. Um, it, Bruce Schneier's article, if you could find it, it's 10 problems with PKI or something. I thought I'd link to it, but I didn't see the link just then. 
I'll just tell you a few random things about it and then let's talk about the exam. All right, you can read all these pretty pictures and because Bruce Schneier basically talks about this whole thing that it sort of aligns up with what I was talking about with is and ought. When you're at the end of the day, <laughs> even if you can trust everyone in sight, you've still got problems with this because suppose, remember Sarah didn't want to get something from Amazon. She wanted to get something from Puppies Are Us. So she gets a certificate signed by someone she really does trust that says, actually, this is really Puppies Are Us website. But what do they mean when they say this is Puppies Are Us website? What do they mean when they say Puppies Are Us? Whose website is it? What they really mean is, well, it's hard to know. That's something in the real world. Computers don't know anything about the real world. Probably what they mean is this website controls email sent to this address. And we've sent a sample email to that address and we've checked that they're able to read it. So I can verify that if you send an email to admin at puppiesrus.com, they can answer it. So those people that were answering that email, they, this is their certificate. But that doesn't tell you it's puppies are us. That ties it to the URL puppiesrus.com. And actually it ties us to the whole mail system and the way that can be faked. So if I wanted to fake um, Amazon, I could set up a site called amazonspecialdeals.com. And then I could control the address info at amazon.specialdeals.com because yeah, sure, I've just got that domain. And then I can get a certificate for it because I control that domain. And I really am Amazon special deals at amazon.com, but I'm not Amazon because when you're thinking you're talking to Amazon, you've got a mental concept of Amazon. It's not a URL. You're thinking it's the company that that Jeff guy owns that's delivered stuff to me before that sort of works, but they exploit their workers a bit. And you know, but you know, it's damn convenient and cheap. That's what you're thinking, that ephemeral idea. But if I can come up with a URL that makes you think of that idea, but isn't owned by that Jeff guy, the certificate authority doesn't know or care. They're just verifying I control that URL. So it's not actually verifying identity. It's really just verifying a domain name. And we all know you can make domain names that look like other domain names very easily. So that's one way of attacking PKI. Ten, Bruce Schneier comes up with 10. So please do read his article. I notice we've only got two minutes left. Uh, can't believe, um, Sarah, you've just spent so much of our time today. <laughs> so I think that's nearly everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, and there's pretty pictures and you can read about them and all sorts of things. So uh, let me just say some, and there's some examples of famous attacks include on PKI. I haven't put any of the recent ones in. The Digi Notar one is fantastic. Uh, just read about this. Yeah, that's, that's what the Darknet Diaries episode is. It's episode oh, is three. Oh, it's, um, it's on DigiNotar, yeah. Oh, oh, everyone watch Darknet. I'm going to watch that too. It's the funniest one. It is so cool, yeah. Um, uh, and then Web of Trust is the alternative. We'll talk about that another day maybe. And homework, yeah, subscribe to Schnei's blog because he's just awesome. And actually, Darknet. Um, Darius. Anyway, uh, ask these questions offline. They're great questions, but I'm just very much aware we're using up China syndrome time. So anyone that wants to watch a China syndrome, you have to pay a couple of bucks to Google it straight away. Google, I want to watch China syndrome on Google. Uh, how can I pay you money and do that? And a page will pop up and you have to pay them. I think I had to pay them $3 or something or $3.99, which is essentially $3 if you think about it. And we will start in 15 minutes and I'll leave this. I'll, what I'll do is I'll shut down now and then I'll instantly reopen with the same ID. So the recording will be finished. Uh, and, uh, and then reconnect if you want to watch it and chat to me. And we'll all chat. And at about a quarter past, if everyone's happy, we'll start watching the movie. Uh, and if you don't watch it now, that's absolutely fine. Uh, but if you do want to watch it now, then you can participate in the discussion at the end. Okay. And everyone, it's so nice to see you after the break. And uh, I, I'm loving watching your Something Awesomes. They are truly awesome. I'm so proud of you all. So well done, everyone. This is fantastic. See you, everyone. Bye, Richard. Bye. Thanks, guys. I'm just going to Bye. 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 Bye, Richard. See ya. Goodbye. See you, guys. Thanks, Richard. No see you, Sarah. See you, see you. See you, Tim. See you, Jazz. See you, Jampy. See you, Tom. Yes, yeah, see, you were good today. Well done. That was awesome. Thank you. I'm going to log out now. I might see you in a sec. Oh, how do I log out? Here we go. <laughs>